Hey everybody, welcome to the program. This is the Other People Podcast. I'm Brad Listy in Los Angeles. It's nice to be with you. Thank you for tuning in. Hope everything's going all right. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the show on social media. TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. So today is Friday. And I'm going to be doing another flashback episode where I dig into the archives and share an outtake from a golden oldie. Today it is episode 647, my conversation with Susan Choi. This episode aired on June 10th, 2020. Susan Choi won the National Book Award in 2019 for her novel, Trust Exercise. That was her fifth novel, I believe. Her first novel, The Foreign Student, won the Asian American Literary Award for Fiction. Her second novel, American Woman, was a finalist for the 2004 Pulitzer Prize. Her third novel, A Person of Interest, was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner. And her fourth, entitled My Education, received a 2014 Lammy Award. Susan Choi serves as a trustee of PEN America, and she teaches in the writing seminars at Johns Hopkins University. An outtake from episode 647, my conversation with Susan Choi is coming up in just a bit. So a quick reminder that I have a newsletter, a weekly email newsletter. You can subscribe for free over at Substack. That is where my newsletter lives online, bradlisty.substack.com. It's pretty simple. I let you know about the latest episodes of the show each week, and I also share a list of of, uh, things that I've been reading and finding interesting, links to things that I've been reading and finding interesting. So if that sounds good, go sign up for my newsletter over at Substack. Likewise, there is a Patreon community for this show, people who love the show, people who listen regularly, people who would like to see this show continue into the future. You can sign up and join the Patreon community over at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. Get yourself some merchandise, a book club subscription, all kinds of goodies over at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. All right, so time for today's flashback, episode 647, my conversation with National Book Award winner Susan Choi. Again, this episode first aired on June 10th, 2020. A reminder that the full episode is available in the feed, so if you like what you hear in this flashback and you want to listen to the full hour with Susan Choi, just go look for episode 647. It is there waiting for you. All right, here I am in June of 2020 talking with Susan Choi. It was so many things and so many things. It's like a, it's like a, an accumulation. I feel like that's the theme of my answers to you today. Every single, every single thing I say is sort of, you know, a variation on lots of different elements. It's hard to but, uh, you know, the different elements were, I think, partly, I totally agree with you that adolescence and the teenage years, I think, are like the most, well, I don't know if you said exactly this, but I, I think that those are like the most impactful years of our lives, maybe. I mean, I have no proof. I'm, not, I'm like not a sociologist or a biologist or a psychologist or any kind of scientist, obviously, but it just intuitively has always seemed to me like that period of time where you're coming of age to use the old phrase is like, obviously if you're coming of age, like the the things that happen to you during this period of transition, when you're not quite a child and you're not quite an adult, but you're trying to find your way in between those two spaces, which are really well-defined in our culture and adolescence and the teenage years are really poorly defined in our culture. I think it's like, no one knows how to view these people who are in this age range 
in part because it's transitional, right? Like, how do we parent people this age? Like, I have a couple of people this age that I'm trying to parent. It's really extremely difficult. You have teenagers? Those part, yeah, I have, a, I have a 15-year-old, and then I have a I have a 12-year-old who's almost 13. So not technically a teen, but Getting very there. much a, an adolescent in spirit. Um, and, you know, very much grappling with all of these issues of, you know, I need support, encouragement, protection. I need you to leave me the f alone. You know, right. I, I don't know what I need right now. <laughs> and um, and so I've always I've always kind of, you know, been really interested in that period of life. Like not just as I experienced it, but in general. I also teach, and I think that, you know, being a teacher has made me really, really like keenly aware. As, as a parent, you're also keenly aware of like how much that relationship between teachers and students has evolved since I was a student. So like all these norms of that teacher-student relationship like have radically, radically, radically shifted. How so? And well, you know, like I would say that they've they've shifted alongside all all sorts of other norms. Like they've shifted alongside, you know, all of the other thinking that now goes under the me too rubric, but that like precedes the me too rubric about like what, what sorts of abuses of power um, can we identify? Like what, what qualifies as, as an abuse of power and what's just a, Oh, come on. Oh, get over it. Oh, you're fine. I think that, you know, in the same way that um, me too kind of, brought into focus like a lot of a lot of much longer term conversations around like what actually is what is sort of abuse and predation and you know uh i mean let's just give an example here's here's an example from like recently in our culture although the, the previous era <laughs> before the current pandemic era you know the kavanaugh hearings which took place as my book was coming into galleys. So like the first kind of publicity event for my book happened the day after the Kavanaugh hearings started, I think, or like they were really close together in time. And, you know, the, the cultural shift from a period of time when a young Christine Blase Ford would, would go home and keep her mouth shut about what had happened to her. to really no one because I remember that period of time stuff happens and you just think, well, I guess that was my fault and I'd better be quiet about it to now when we are able to say like, look, you know, this is, this is an instance of, of abuse and this is not not something that somebody should either a blame themselves for or B pretend didn't happen because it it was a non-event. So I think like those norms have shifted a lot in the classroom, right? To get back to what I was trying to say. And things that might have happened between a teacher and a student in say the eighties when I was in school that that would have seemed not normal necessarily, but not actionable. I gotta say if you uh, know, I, if we look at them now, we're like, what the Do you know what I mean? I, I feel oh, like I'm being very long winded. No, what no. what I mean is that I, I think I think we've become we become both more sensitive as a culture and also more confused maybe about what our role is in, in, in trying to deal with these events. Well, I'll tell you, when you're talking about how things have changed, I am thinking of my public high school in Indianapolis where I went to high school. Um, it's like one of these big Midwestern suburban public high schools. I don't know if that's like a familiar, if that paints any kind of familiar picture, but <laughs> like there were yeah. like the, the amount of sexual deviance, among teachers and administrators. Not that it was, you know, I don't want to overstate it. It wasn't like every teacher and every administrator was some kind of uh, pervert or something, but there was a teacher who was openly dating a junior in high school. Everybody knew it. I, I remember it, seeing, exactly. I remember seeing them at like blockbuster video and being like, Hey guys, you know, like they were dating. He was 30. She was 16. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, then, it was exa- exactly. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that sort of stuff. And like, and like everybody, all the teachers knew it. I remember there was a teacher in my high school who he, he flirted very overtly with, uh, like pretty girls who were like seniors. And then 
literally like a week after graduation, he would find a way to call them or something and be like, do you want to go get a, you know, go get a bite to eat? And he was very much like trying to hit on high school girls, but he kind of was playing it safe, I guess, or something, you know, like the, the legal, right. the legalistic approach. And then there was a female teacher who was sort of notorious for having relationships with students. And I think back on this now and I'm like, my God, like what were people thinking? Like times have really changed. And I, you know, thank goodness, but it's definitely a different world. And the world that you describe in your book, uh, is familiar to me on that level. It is also familiar to me when I think about the, like we had a pretty strong drama department at my school. It wasn't a school exclusively devoted to the, uh, performing arts, but, uh, that was important, you know, in my public high school. And I remember that particular, uh, like subset of the student population being kind of cloistered and like very intense. And I, I want to talk to you about that. Like the world of high school, uh, in general can feel that way. You know, these, like you talk about, the. Uh, the relationships between teachers and students and the relationships uh, among students themselves and how when you're that age it really does feel like the whole world you know like everything that yeah. hap- everything that happens within those walls just has this kind of uh you know intensity and and going to a, a performing arts high school and being among i don't know dramatic people <laughs> like do you think the intensity was higher do you did it? Ha- I mean, did it really leave uh, a mark on you? Were, were you that way as a as a student? Well, I mean, it left it left positive marks on me. You know, I had a really positive experience. Happily, you know, my school wasn't Kappa, and my experience wasn't the experience of those characters. But at the same time, my experience was full of exactly what you're talking about—that kind of intensity of emotion and focus, and sort of like yeah, this like sense of a cloister, like not really, not really like knowing or caring about the world outside. Right. Which is there. These are dangerous conditions. If, if something goes wrong, you know what I mean? And like happily for me and, and for my school and, and for my experience, all of the positives of that sort of a situation prevailed, you know, which is that like intense camaraderie, you know, this intense sense of like being special, doing something special, you know, being different from regular kids and, and, you know, pledging your, pledging your dedication to something exalted, like, like the theater, you know, we were, we were so, we were so like passionate and naive and, and it was wonderful, you know, um, but that could also like go south really easily. And I think like your point about how cloistered it is, is really an important one because, you know, it's just what you were saying about like your high school and the fact that those relationships were really normalized. It's like that happens when you don't have any frame of reference. Right. And I feel like in high school, we don't have a very large frame of reference. Like the high school is our frame where we're like, this is the world. You know, and if that's happening in your world, if your teachers are routinely dating students, then you're going to you're going to internalize the idea that that's normal. That's a totally normal relationship. And um, I think that was really interesting to me was like the 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 potential for really like kind of wonderful life changing stuff in that period of time emotionally and, and the potential for kind of negatively life changing stuff. All right, folks, there we have it. That was my conversation with Susan Choi back in episode 647. It first aired on June 10th, 2020. A reminder that the full episode is available in the feed, so if you would like to listen to the full hour with Susan Choi, just look for episode 647. It is there waiting for you. You can find Susan on the internet at susanchoi.com and on Facebook and Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe to this program wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the show on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. You can sign up for my email newsletter for free over at Substack. And you can join the Other People Patreon community at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. Help keep this show going into the future, patreon.com slash otherpplpod. 
If you have a couple of minutes and you want to do me a quick favor, please give this show a rating. Wherever you listen, write a little review. It helps the show in the algorithm. It helps it in the rankings. It helps it find new listeners. If you would like some other people apparel, a t-shirt or a sweatshirt, head on over to the show's official website, otherppl.com. And finally, if you would like to read my latest novel, it is called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything, available now in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. I narrate the audiobook, so I'll read it to you. It's my book. It's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. All right, so Sunday there will be an episode, I'm pretty sure. It's a holiday weekend, so it's a little wonky. I have been traveling. I'm sorting things out. So it's TBD. It'll be a surprise. Stay tuned.